Okay, we now turn to cash from investing activities. So at this point, we have an interesting question, which is what we don't really have a disclosure for what the company's capital expenditures are. But what we do have is a balance sheet that shows us that property plant equipment is going up by roughly $47 million during the year. And so the question becomes, is that is that sufficient information to back into capital expenditures? We know from general accounting that property plant equipment goes up. What makes property plant equipment go up from one period to the next is primarily purchases of new equipment or, or, or capital expenditures. But there's something else that consistently makes property plant and equipment go down, and that's depreciation. And so we have to keep in mind that while we do see this increase here, this net increase, some of that may be due to depreciation. And so the question becomes, how much of that is due to depreciation? Do we know what depreciation was during the period? And the answer is we kind of do. We know the depreciation and amortization together was 20. But here we also know that amortization was 5, meaning that depreciation as a component of DNA was 15. And with that, we have enough information to back into what capital expenditures are. Now, uh, the, the caveat here is there are, of course, other potentially other things that may move property, plant, equipment up or down, things like asset sales and write downs and, and things of that nature. But for this simplified example, we don't have any disclosures about any asset sales or any write downs or anything of that nature. And so we assume that the two main driving components of property, plant, equipment are capital expenditures and depreciation. And so I'm, I, we put a little schedule down below to sort of clarify how we're going to back into this. And so we know the property, plant, equipment, BOP here stands for beginning of period, was 212.7. That comes from right here. And we also know that at the end of the period, is 259 and that comes from right here and we know that the the pp &E balance did go down by 15 million and so the question is let's back in how do we <coughs> excuse me back into capital expenditures and that becomes a simple case of arithmetic if those are the only two variables one of which we know we take the beginning of the year minus the depreciation minus the negative depreciation minus the beginning of period balance and what we arrive at is if the PPE at the beginning of the period started at 212. It went down by depreciation of 15, and it ended at 259. Well, we know that by definition, then CapEx must have been 61. And so we scroll back here, and we can reference that number. And we have to make sure that we are careful to switch the sign because capital expenditures are an outflow, not an inflow. That's a common mistake when building financial models. You forget to sort of switch the sign. Capital expenditures is a reduction in cash. And then that takes us to our next and final portion of the, you know, of, of activities that are investing activities. And here on the balance sheet, we have to look and sort of see, is there anything else that could be construed as an investing activity? And what we discover is that typically long term assets, although it's, it's not it's not a guarantee, but typically and unless we have reason otherwise, line items that are called other and their lo other long term assets or long term assets that are classified as other tend to be investing related assets not always the case but most of the time the case and so we see this increase and remembering the rule we see an increase in assets it means it's a reduction in um, it's a use of cash and so we're gonna reflect that formula here and sort of again let's just remind ourselves of the intuition here if these were investments we had to spend money presumably to generate those investments and so this represents a use of cash. That's the, that's how we grow our assets. We have to we have to use funds to grow our assets. There is one other asset that we still haven't accounted for. Keep in mind we've already taken into account accounts receivable and inventories, property, plant, equipment, deferred taxes, and now other long-term assets. But intangible assets, including goodwill, which is a type of intangible asset, we haven't taken into account yet. The question there becomes increases in all other long-term assets. This can be a little confusing because this actually includes every other investing activity. And so we've captured other long-term assets in there, but we should also take into account any new purchases of intangible assets. That certainly would count as an investing activity. The question is, how do we do that? We see that intangible assets grew by approximately 8 million during the period. So is that the amount of cash that was spent to purchase intangibles? And the answer is not quite, because very similar to property, plant, and equipment, there's something fairly systematic that also reduces intangible assets, and that is amortization. We know that amortization during the period was 5 million, and so this increase is actually 
net of that five million. So if we scroll down below and do a similar sort of calculation for intangibles, where we start with the beginning of period intangible asset balance of 34, we know that amortization, let's make that a negative five because amortization reduces the intangible asset balance. And we know that intangibles at the end of the period was 42.5. Well, again, it's actually the same formula to back into what are the new purchases of intangibles. It's simply the end of period minus the amortization and the beginning of period balance. And we get to 13.3. Again, it could be that there are other things that are driving theoretically. The, it could be changing the, good, the intangibles and goodwill balance. There could, be, there could be a write down, there could be sales, but we don't, in this simplified example, we haven't identified any of that. And so it boils down to these sort of two driving, um, sort of driving activities. And so in here, we're gonna embed, again, and this needs to be a negative, we're gonna subtract that $13 million. And at this point, we have all of our investing activities and we can now turn to financing activities. So at this point, also keep in mind that we've actually really, and this is sort of consistent with what, how these are classified, virtually all of the assets, in fact, all of the assets except for cash have been accounted for in the cash flow statement reconciliation. In fact, we've mentioned this before, but we can think of the cash flow statement as simply a reconciliation of year over year changes in the balance sheet. And now financing activities tend to be liabilities and equity items. And so we're going to see that we're going to start going through the liability and the equity side of the balance sheet as we try to understand what's happened to cash from a financing perspective. So increases in borrowing is the first thing we need to look at. Did the company borrow any more, which would have added cash to the company's financials? And we see that, yes, in fact, the company did borrow more. They took on a note. They borrowed more from the bank. And we see liability, again, the rule is liability is going up, that's an inflow, and that's consistent with the intuition here that as you borrow more, that's an inflow. And long-term debt, we have two components of long-term debt on the balance sheet, both the current portion of long-term debt and long-term debt. And so what we see is we need to treat those as sort of one item in the cash flow statement, there's only one line item here. And so we see long-term debt at the, at the end of the, the projected year minus long-term debt, both current portion and, and regular long-term debt. In the beginning of the year, oh, we did, we did a formula wrong. Let's see, minus, it should be a minus because we're taking the end of the period minus both the beginning of period ones. And we get an increase of 18.8. That means in aggregate, we borrowed, we took on an extra $18.8 .8 million in debt. Preferred stock, let's scroll down here and, and see. It looks like we did issue an additional 1.1 million of preferred stock. We have now common stock and APIC. This is the, we can think of these two line items actually together. And they're sort of just, there's a, there's a, there's a, it's a conventional difference between the two, but substantively when you issue stock, a portion of the value of that stock is attributed to common stock par value and the remaining portion attributed to additional paid in capital or APIC. So for being consistent with the cash flow statement, we're going to look at these two things separately, but they're really the same economically. And we see we issued a little bit more common stock, 1.8 million. And as we'd expect, we also are issuing additional paid in capital. So in total, we issued approximately $19 million in, in shares. Treasury stock is when you buy back shares and you'll see treasury stock in the balance sheet as what's called a contra account. You see it's a negative number that's growing. It's becoming more negative, indicating the company is continuing to buy back shares again. Liabilities and equity increases are represented as increases on the cash flow statement and vice versa. Some of you may be wondering, hey, why would you be issuing stock at the same time that you're buying back stock? There's, there are some reasons for that, which we're gonna talk about in, uh, in subsequent uh, quick lessons. The main, you know, the main reason is sometimes you have to, you, you actually have to issue stock for stock option holders, et cetera and to try to mitigate the dilutive impact of that you may go ahead and try to buy back some shares um lastly dividends we know that the company issued dividends of 31.4 we have to remember that that is an outflow so we have to put a minus sign and reverse a sign there and we have concluded our total cash from financing activities and at this point we are ready to wrap this up let's First, identify what is the total change in cash during the period? Well, that's cash from operations plus cash from investing activities 
plus cash from financing activities. And what does that leave us in terms of an end of period cash balance? Well, let's look at our starting cash balance. Our ending cash balance is therefore just the beginning cash balance plus the total change in cash during the period. And with that, guys, we can wrap this up. We can go into cash and equivalents, reference what we just discovered from the cash flow statement. We can hit Alt plus sign and get total current assets. If we scroll down, we can also finish up the retained earnings component of our balance sheet. Retained earnings at the end of this period equals last period's retained earnings plus net income minus dividends. Some of you may have noticed actually, there was a way to cheat here, and that is you could have actually figured this out a long time ago, which would have gotten you the total liabilities and shareholders equity, which would have enabled you to back into the cash figure here without doing any of this that was would have of course shortchanged the purpose of the exercise uh, the purpose of the exercise was to go through all this and understand how to back into a cash flow statement or how to derive a cash flow statement from a given balance sheet the reason why in this exercise you could actually back into it is because we've given you all of the other forecasts already and so you could have cheated and backed into it obviously that that wasn't the point of the exercise but for those that are a little bit crafty you may have noticed that you could have done that and with that we have our the conclusion of this exercise the main takeaway here is that we have a cash flow statement consistent with what we'd expect net income is a little bit different from cash from operations a portion of the cash generated is going out by way of investing activities and then financing activities are fairly discretionary to what a management team wants to do and then it is not by coincidence that if you do this consistently, and here's the main takeaway and what sets really the foundation for financial modeling, is that since we did this correctly, we were able to capture the year-over-year -year change of just about every balance sheet line item. If you'll notice, every single line item here on the balance sheet is perfectly, is actually captured in the cash flow statement, whether directly or indirectly. For example, net income is indirectly captured because it's a component of retained earnings, right? So retained earnings is, a, is comprised of net income and dividends, both of which are captured in here, whereas some other line items are directly captured, like accounts receivable. So the takeaway is whether or not it's direct or indirect, every single line item on the balance sheet is captured in the cash flow statement. If you do this correct, your model will balance. In other words, your total assets will by default, by definition, equal liabilities and shareholders equity. If I missed something, let's say I forgot to capture dividends. My model is thrown out of balance. My total assets are 1105, whereas my liabilities and shareholders equity are 1074. And that's the main takeaway, that you know that you got it right when the model balances, when assets equal liabilities plus shareholders equity. And in fact, what you'll see in many models, I'm gonna add a row here, by the way, to do that, it's shift spacebar control shift plus to add a row. And you'll see a lot of actual complex models have what's called a balance check here to ensure that they did things correctly. And the way the balance check works is it looks at assets and subtracts from that liabilities and shareholders equity to make sure that it equals zero. And if something went wrong, it wouldn't equal zero. Hope you enjoyed this quick lesson. Tune back in for, for other lessons.